You're in the water loop. <laughs> Hi, this is Travis with Waterloop. High Sierra showerheads are an awesome choice because of their water efficiency, but they have to look good too. And with High Sierra, the design and style options mean they can fit into any bathroom. Finishes come in chrome, brushed nickel, oil rub bronze, and polished brass. In addition to the sleek classic model, High Sierra also offers a half dome design, handheld options, extension arms, and trickle valves to control flow. Plus, High Sierra offers the Reflections model, the only fogless shaving mirror with a built in shower head. You can use promo code WATERLOOP for 20% off any of these options at HighSierraShowerHeads.com. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. Welcome to Waterloop. This is Travis. Very excited to be joined by Mark Matson. He is president of Swim Drink Fish. He is the Lake Ontario waterkeeper. And as we were discussing before we started recording, he's got a bunch of different hats and activities he's involved in joining from Canada. Mark, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Travis. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, yeah, it's uh, we're in the heart of the summer and um, yeah. And I know that you're, you've come up this to the Thousand Island way where I'm from, and a lot of people are having, yeah, we're just, we seem to be worlds apart in the U.S. and Canada. These <laughs> I know, days right? And COVID. I know, I know. Very different yeah. standings and all that kind of thing. Yeah, we were talking mm -hmm. that uh, the other end of Lake Ontario, where St. Lawrence River comes into Lake Ontario, is the Thousand Islands. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just this, this amazing region of all these islands and uh, just a, a beautiful place. And I've, I grew up going there. Family has a cottage there. Um, and so, uh, wonderful, wonderful place and hope to get back up soon. But, um, the other end of the lake, uh, you've got Toronto mm -hmm. there on, on, on Lake Ontario. Um, what's the, what's the relationship like between, you know, the people of Toronto and, and Lake Ontario? Well, you know, Toronto, in many ways, I like to think of Toronto as the freshwater capital of the world because it has the Oak Ridges Moraine just above it to the north, which feeds into many, I think there are nine major rivers that run through Toronto, places like the Don River, the Humber, Highlands Creek, Rouge, Petticoat, Dufferins, Port Credit. And this is all um, groundwater, you know, that's coming from the Moraine and feeding into the lake. And then, you know, at the bottom of the you know, the city is Lake Ontario, one of the great lakes in the world. And so Toronto is surrounded by fresh water. Um, on the other hand, <laughs> you know, I, I didn't grow up in Toronto and I moved there in the late 80s. I was a lawyer at a large law firm and I was on the 67th floor, believe it or not. And I used to look out over the lake and it was just orange, like a toilet bowl. And, you know, the coal fire plants were belching out and there really wasn't anywhere I could swim. I came from Wolf Island, a thousand islands like you, and um, we really had a connection to the lake and to the water. We fished and I learned to swim there. And, you know, many of us drank the water from the river. And um, when I got to Toronto, it just seemed so different. It seemed like the city was so disconnected mm -hmm. from the lake. Um, you know, that was 30 years ago and I think, or 35. And I think the Things have been changing since then. A lot of it, I think, is due to the work of Lake Ontario Waterkeeper and Swim Drink Fish. We've really um, tried to underscore that the cultural connection and the important connection um, between the city and the lake, and that this is, um, you know, something that maybe we've forgotten or maybe we were pushed away from with with um, pollution, et cetera. We put up signs, don't fish, don't swim, don't drink. And we thought we were protecting people in the short term. You know, we were their health. But in the long term, we were pushing them away. We were losing generations of people in the cities who no longer had a connection. And so we really felt like we need to take those, needed to take those signs down. So that's why eventually we used to say Swim, Drink, Fish um, as our tagline. <laughs> but eventually the group became known as Swim, Drink, Fish, which is, you know, a, a, a play on the idea that we need swimmable, drinkable, fishable water for all, for everyone. Mm. And so I think that's where Toronto is. I think Toronto's still growing. I think this summer, particularly with COVID, we're seeing more people at the beaches and looking for access to the water and, and really developing relationships with the lake than ever before. 
um, they haven't been able to travel or go to their cottages or their camps. So they're looking a little closer to home. And, and that's been really interesting. It's been a lot of hard work to make sure we keep the you know data um, up to speed so they know where the beaches are, that they can swim and what they can do. But I, I think Toronto is um, emerging and hopefully continues to emerge as the freshwater capital of the world. Yeah. I know that, you know, in the United States, we had the Clean Water Act in the in the mm-hmm. early 70s, the establishment of US EPA. And that really did help to turn a lot of things around. Um, some of the big discharges, right? The industrial mm-hmm. discharges, stuff just coming out of pipes. Um, was there a similar turning point in, in Toronto and for Canada where, you know, like you're saying, those big discharges just were dealt with and, and that helped the water quality improve? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'm a, I've been on the board of the Waterkeeper Alliance for 20 years, so I know about the Clean Water <laughs> Act. Um, the 50th anniversary is coming up in 2022. Yeah. And there's also the 50th anniversary of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement under the IJC. So that um, that also is in 2022. And that was specifically targeted to Canada and the U.S. by national agreement about um, cleaning up the Great Lakes. Um, and in Canada, at the very same time as the Clean Water Act went forward, and it was a federal, um, you know, it was a federal initiative, not statewide, so it was sort of national. And so under the Constitution in the U.S., commerce is a federal heading. In Canada, it's different. It's a provincial, is really property rights and civil rights. So the federal government in Canada had to come up with something a little bit different. And so criminal law and fisheries were federal. So Canada... Um, came up with some quasi-criminal laws like the Fisheries Act, the Navigable Waters Protection Act. And these and these pieces of legislation were used to really put in place strong environmental law in Canada at the same time as the Clean Water Act. So both countries were trying to move together at the same time um, because so much of the water was shared between our countries and the impacts through wildlife and migration of fish. So w- we have a similar we had a similar motive. Um, to ensure that our waters are swimmable, drinkable, fishable for everyone. But we use different laws and different processes to get there. I think that's interesting um, in how, um, you know, we both were able to find a way to to work together and to try and deal with the problems. And ultimately that we all know from Earth Day in 72 hmm. was, was really, you know, the biggest, largest demonstration in the streets that we had ever experienced really. And, and I think, um, yeah, and I, I think there's been a lot of great things that have come out of that in particular engagement of communities to really work for their clean waters. Yeah. So in the Toronto area Mm -hmm. of Lake Ontario, what were the big challenges with the water when you kind of started things with swim, drink fish and, and the, and the Lake Ontario water keeper, you know, 20 years ago, whatever that, whatever that was. Mm-hmm. I think I sort of referred to it, but access um, hmm. is it was a big issue. Um, places had been closed down because of pollution in the past. Landfills filled in wetlands and marshes, so you know people were pushed away. Um, very few beaches, and most of the water was polluted by sewage. I would say sewage is the largest pollution problem on the Great Lakes. Um, because most people live in urban areas, and the combined sewer overflows, which are the way we built our cities 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago, we put one pipe where we had sewage in half the pipe <laughs> and storm water in the other half, and one went to the sewage treatment plant and one went to the lake. And when it rains, and certainly we've seen, you know, 2017, 2019, um, 2004, 2007, we have, we've had some crazy storms. Climate is changing, and they're more intense and more rain has come, and so that's caused greater and greater problems with these CSOs. They discharge more often. And um, that that sewage just, you know, had such an impact on pushing people away from the rivers and the waterfronts and the, and the beaches. And so that's, for me, that defined the biggest problem in Toronto. But there are other problems, of course. We have many landfills discharging metals, PCBs, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, other toxins into the river that are being picked up in the birds and the fish. And, you know, I think the most un... un underrated but one of the most greatest threats to the great lakes and it's not talked about much is that was the nuclear industry and the number of nuclear plants particularly in ontario and close to the city darlington with its eight reactors pickering with its eight and the waste beside those sites that still hasn't been moved or Hmm. you know they haven't determined where they're going to put it long term those sorts of 
risks, although, you know, oftentimes seen as small. But when you look at the consequence of what would happen if that waste was discharged into the lake and rendered the water unfit for drinking water, all of a sudden you realize the risk is, although seemingly small, it's it's real because if there is an accident, um, it, you know, there's 45 million people who are depending on and drinking that that fresh water from the Great Lakes, which, you know, is 20% of the world's surface fresh water, 95% of the U.S. fresh water supply, you know, yeah. you just can't afford to lose it. So those were the issues, sewage, landfill, leachate, and uh, nu- nuclear plants, really, those were the big ones. And of course, there is always um, the air pollution as well that was coming from coal and other things that was that was precipitating into the lakes and getting into the food chain. So you get going with with swim, swim drink fish. What was the what was the approach? What was the work of of this organization? And so I began as a lawyer, and I was actually going to be a corporate lawyer, but I started moving into civil rights um, issues, and a lot of the um, those those issues ended up becoming environmental issues in the '90s. And I volunteered to do prosecutions in Canada. You can step in the shoes of the Queen. Um, and bring prosecutions in the criminal court for pollution. You can't do that in the U.S. You use tort law but um, under the Clean Water Act. But I started doing that as a volunteer investigator and lawyer and prosecutor. And I knew of Robert Kennedy Jr. from some of my work in the early 90s. And um, he was starting Waterkeeper Alliance in 1999. And he talked to me about, you know, giving up my private practice and doing this full time. Hmm. And so, you know, my... If I had to reduce it to one thing, I would say I learned from the labor movement, the civil rights movement, and the you know, and I felt the environmental movement was the same, where you have to give meaning and force to your laws, in this case, environmental laws, and all the high-minded speeches about, you know, environmental sustainability and and um, you know, clean water were meaningless if you didn't have meaning and force for your laws. So, being a lawyer. I just heard force <laughs> and, <laughs> and I went out and polluted, you know, you pollute, we prosecute. And, you know, we did a lot, we gave a lot of, um, we did a lot of investigations and in legal um, work, but I sort of skipped over the word meaning. And I, you know, along with my partner at the time, um, Kristen Tully, who's still with us and, you know, and her and I are really, um, we were worked closely for 20 years. You know, we started thinking, what does that mean? Um, not just for us, what's the meaning of environmental laws? And so we realized that the laws were being rolled back. People were undermining the laws. No one knew that they were there. And the reason was because people didn't realize what the laws were protecting anymore. They didn't have meaning. And we felt like we really started to need to build a movement of people who are working for swimmable, drinkable, fishable water. And the best way to do that is to connect them to the water again. What's the simplest portal for becoming an environmental voice or becoming a leader on the environment? It usually starts with going for a swim. (laughs) It usually starts where your grandfather takes you fishing. It starts with a paddle. Um, It starts with, um, you know, just that, that connection that someone made for you between the water the river, the lake, and the ocean, and, and you. And th- that is where we needed to work again. And so swimming and recreational water has some really clear standards about when water is fit for swimming and not, um, you know, health risk assessments are clear and they're understood. And so we started identifying all the beaches on the lake hmm. and started putting together all the sampling that had been done at those beaches. And then technology was changing. We started realizing you know, we, we can share this stuff <laughs> in different ways. We can share it with everyone. And so that's how Swim Guide came about. It really was using a platform, using the regulations and the health risk assessments around sampling and, you know, the, 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 the rec water at every beach and pinpointing every beach and showing them where the beaches are. When you go to that beach, is it safe for, or not safe, but is there enough information that you can make the decision as to whether to go swimming, um, whether to let your dog go swimming and throw its sticks, et cetera. So that was swim guide. And then swim guide taught us so much about the community and how many people want to be engaged and want to connect again with water. So since that time we've gone on to, you know, really spread swim guide from just Lake Ontario to the great lakes now to the U S Mexico. I I believe we're in nine countries. Now we, we reached over 5 million users. And I think, you know, it's it's become an example yeah. for others um, how to build meaning around our waterways that ultimately will will um, 
you know, it's the, we're seeding the next generation of voices for water, and we're quite proud of that. And so that's how we, we're still giving meaning and force <laughs> to laws, but we're, we're focusing a lot on the meaning side because we think the meaning will ultimately give um, a lot more um, um, support for the laws and the regulations that protect public health and people. Yeah, I love that point that uh, people care about something when they're really personally connected to it. I, mm-hmm. I, I remember vividly when I was like 12 years old, old going on a school field trip to the Chesapeake Bay and uh, mm-hmm. they took us on a moonlight canoe paddle, you know, and I, I vividly remember that the moon, like the bird, the birds kind of on the water and the smell of the marsh and like, um, you know, I was a nature kid and all that, but that was like a, a moment that, it kind of like, wow, this is an amazing, we got to protect this kind of thing. And I, I don't know how mm. much, 20 years later, I ended up working on Chesapeake Bay restoration and cleanup stuff. You know, um, I wrote about that experience as my job cover letter, <laughs> my application. But, oh, wow. But, uh, you know, well, well, you know, Travis, I'll just say, I, I hear that. And every speech I start, I tell people about my, we call them watermarks. Mm. Um, because they're marks that are never leave us. I mean, my name's Mark too, but <laughs> they're watermarks. And that story um, that you told me, you know, tells me more about you and why we're doing the show here today. Right. And, you know, my watermark on Wolf Island, which I already talked to you about pre-show, you know, growing up there and learning to swim and my family and just everything I know um, about the smells of the water and my love for it comes from, from that story. And so we do have an online storytelling um project called watermark where we you know we do try and get people to tell us what's their most powerful story about being around water and ultimately we then put those stories on that water body so others can see them and learn from them and you know it sort of builds a community right there because other people there go oh my god i didn't know that (laughs) you know you and so it's a way of building the movement as well but it's through that storytelling and 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 i just love when you just told me that i just think it's great yeah well it's sort of it's so true and i get to know, know a little bit of, it's, there's a certain intimacy sure that about it well i'm gonna yeah. i'm gonna go on there and check that out and look at, and and submit something uh oh great c- contribute my story and um yeah you, you you talk to people that work in water and they all have something like that right that kind of mm-hmm. where that connected and catapulted them forward um mm-hmm. all right watermark that's cool i want to talk a little more about swim guide um as i mm-hmm. mentioned before i've used it for years, uh, especially when I lived in Annapolis, Maryland, and I would go paddling on, you know, the rivers around there on the Chesapeake Bay. I'm like, let's, is the water good? (laughs) Is it, is it, you know, safe for me to get in right now? Um, so could you just talk, it's an app. I encourage people to go on and download it from, you know, the app store or Google, whatever. Um, so how does it work just practically? If you, if you're a person, you download that, how do you use it? Yeah, so yeah, and there's also a website, www.theswimguide.org. Um, you know, everyone uses things different, and I'm 58 years old, so I'm very, I love maps. Mm. That's how I think of things. So I, you know, there's a list of beaches, right, that comes up right away. The closest one to where you are will appear. But you can also look at a map, and, uh, you know, the map comes up, and you can see all the beaches. And then you you can go to the beach, open it up, and there's so much information there. It tells you about the beach, you know, how, why it was named, how to get there, et cetera. But then it also tells you about the water quality there. How many times is it sampled? When is it sampled? When was the last time it was sampled? And then there's a chart. I love charts as well. That tells you, you know, how, it's a pie chart, and it tells you when it was sampled, how many times did it pass, and how many times did it fail. And right there, you have a lot of information about that beach, um, that, you know, for, for someone like me, maybe, um, you know, I'm a little bit more water literate. So for mm-hmm. me, it just tells me right away, is this a place I want to go and swim and, or what do I want to do there? But for others who use it and start to realize, you know, or start to learn mm-hmm. what those water quality sampling and how often, and et cetera, then they build that water literacy as well. So you use it, um, you use it regularly. Um, and the more you use it, the more you learn about the places, um, the people, um, and the water quality in your, in your watershed or your water hood, as some people call ah. it. Um, or if you want to travel to another water hood, <laughs> you know, where you don't know much about it, you can use swim guide and it will give you a really clear idea, uh, of what the water's like there as well. So there's also 
a photo. Um, you know, you can take pictures of pollution. It connects you to your, if a water keeper's in the area that's doing the sampling, it's a real movement builder as well. So you can, if you want to get involved, you can volunteer, you can get involved in the water quality sampling programs. Water hubs are starting to form all across the U.S. and Canada with citizen science where they're learning how to do water quality sampling for bacteria and um, becoming part of the data collection. I think one third of all the data in swim guide is provided through affiliates. Mm. So um, those are those are groups that ultimately do the water quality sampling and, and upload it to swim guide. A lot of the other data, of course, is government sampling. Um, so it's, you know, it's an indispensable tool if you're uh, if you love the water and you surf or you paddle or you swim or anything else um, that you want to do around water. And it's also a way for you to get involved in the movement for swimmable, drinkable, fishable water because you know, there's, it's such a meaningful engagement tool. And what you're doing is so valuable to the overall um, data about um, and baseline for the water quality in that area. It is that data, ultimately, um, that is used to restore um, beach water quality. Mm. It's, you know, it's that's the evidence that ultimately, if you want to fix things, you don't even know if there's a problem first. But if there is a problem, it's really great to have that level of data to go to government to um, to correct the problem and to and to ensure that um, your your beaches or you have access to water that's safe for your family and your community. Yeah, in in your water hood, I have not heard that before. Uh, despite oh. despite living in in water every day, uh, the water world. So that's that's awesome. I will have to drop that one. Um, I want to I want to you know I asked kind of about the challenges uh, 20, 30 years ago with Lake Ontario. Uh, I'm assuming a lot of progress has been made. It's it's it greatly improved water quality. And then the other part of that is then what are the the pressing challenges now? Yeah, I, I mean, when it comes to bacteria and sewage and stuff, it's all it's it's never going to go away. We have to continue to upgrade, to monitor, to control, and to treat you know sewage. Um, so that's. That that's still a, that that's a process. We're mm-hmm. going to work keep working on that. Um, it's it's gotten a lot better, but now there are other um, contaminants that are emerging. Plastics, for example, and pharmaceuticals, which you know when you think about it, you're, they're coming out of our sewage treatment plants, and we're not really treating. We're not they're not made to treat those contaminants, and they're going into the lake, and we're drinking the water. So there's a lot of concern around those those new emerging contaminants. And the legacy wastes are still there. I mean, Myrex, which came from the Hooker Company on, on um, Grand Isle. I don't know if you remember. Mm. It was a notorious case, and Lo- Lois Gibbs, I believe, and it was re- really the activist who raised the issue of uh, Love Canal. It was called. Um, but that was a chemical called Myrex, and Myrex still is in, you know, the large carp and the, you know, mm. and the large fish in the lake because it just has. Um, you know, just like the PCBs, they've lingered and they continue to haunt us with um, being in the food and the fish. So those are, you know, still contaminants of concern when it comes to eating fish. And of course, it's not just humans eating fish, birds eat the fish, mm-hmm. fish eat each fish. So it's in the it's in the ecosystem. Um, those are still problems. And as I say, the long term disposal of the, the used nuclear fuel rods, mm. um, that's that's going to cost hundreds, billions of dollars. And I don't think anybody wants it moved into their neighborhood. They're all sitting in pools by the nuclear power plants, whether it's on Georgian Bay at Bruce or Darlington or Pickering. And I know on the American sides as well in Oswego and other places, that's something, you know, maybe our generation won't figure out, but the next generation will have to figure out how to secure that waste so that it doesn't um, ultimately contaminate. So it's, it's, it's not in the water so much right now, but it's sitting there on the edge of our water, mm. of our well, and um, it continues to shadow the lakes until we find a solution for it. So those those are the really the big issues. Mm. I I think, but I, I do believe it's a process for all of us. We've like we had this huge success in the city of Kingston. Do you know Kingston, Ontario? I do. Um, yeah, you know, we're in Toronto. Yeah, and uh, Gord Downey was a singer in a band called The Tragical Hip, which is a famous Canadian band. Um, and he passed away sadly a few years ago. But he was a friend of mine and was on my board. And he grew up across from a old coal pier in Kingston, and they had stopped swimming in, in the city, like almost all urban. You know, most cities on the Great Lakes they don't have a lot of urban swimming, um, and 
you know, we, we, we worked a lot on the sewage treatment and the sewage um, CSOs and, and Kingston, you know, expanded the sewage plan, put in real time monitoring for its for, for all its pipes. It's uh, that's very rare. Hmm. Um, so, you know, if anything's being discharged and where. And then went ahead and restored the coal um, pier into a swimming pier and brought an architect in. And uh, my group, Swim Drink Fish, got some funding we put in there. And just before Gord passed away, I asked if he'd allow us his name to be on it. So it's wow. called the Gord Edgar Downey Pier. And it has been the most popular. It's a deep water swimming pier. It's been the most popular place on the entire lake. And it changes the way that the city of Kingston sees the lake. And it has really inspired me. In so many ways um, that, you know, that if we, you know, if we can get the next generation, by the way, it's, it's all generations who are swimming there <laughs> um, and, and everyone swims there and all, all, all kinds of people. And it's so crowded, but it's so beautiful. And it just, it's just, it's changed the way that people see the, see the lake. And I'm so proud of it. And I wish every city had a deep water swimming pier on the Great Lakes, because I think, it could teach so much um, about connections to the lake, to wilderness, to water, to our drinking water, to the ecosystem. Just just by having that opportunity to 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 feel it and to to feel that um, lake in a really fun and and um, enjoyable way. So that's, that's a- it's funny that it's such a success for me, <laughs> but I just feel it every time I'm there. I'm so proud when I see the people jumping off, et cetera. That's a, that's an awesome, awesome story. And like you said, it makes that connection. Then people will get engaged and get active and, and, mm-hmm. and fight for the water. Um, I just wanted to ask you one or two last things. Uh, I used to work at us environmental protection agency, uh, in, in DC. And I know there was a lot of emphasis on kind of the U S Canada, great lakes, collaboration um Mm -hmm. how how has that gone um in your mind i know the past few years have been a bit different with our administration here but um Mm. has has that been a beneficial collaboration 100 percent um i think it's one of the oldest sort of um agreements between two countries around water um, ever, I think um, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement and the um, meetings held between the U.S. and Canada, and now of course bringing in the Indigenous voices as well, which should have been done before, but is now being recognized that there's more than two nations around the Great Lakes. Um, I think it's been going for 105 years now. Um, wow! I've been on the Great Lakes. Yeah, I've been on the Great Lakes Water Quality Board for eight years myself. Um, the IJC, the International Joint Commission's Great Lakes Water Quality Board. And it just, it's amazing to put people from all the lakes and public interest groups and government, um, industry people in the same room to talk about the problems and the issues. Um, some people criticize it because it doesn't have that, you know, it, it, it's not a stick. It's not a powerful mm. law. It can't just fix things right away. But the fact that it brings together all these people um, to talk about the issues and to look for um, agreement and resolution and and you know reconciliation on so many issues, I think it's just been so valuable, and um, I think it doesn't get the credit it deserves oh. um, for you know not only getting us through the last 30, 40 years of pollution and really understanding the issues, but I think it's starting to really paint a picture of what the future can look like. Um, and I'm certainly feeling that governments are changing and they're starting to recognize the value, you know, to, that they've undervalued the Great Lakes and that they need to invest in it and they need to protect it. And I definitely see the people in the cities, whether it's Rochester, or Buffalo, Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, you know, Toronto, Hamilton, Kingston. It, it's just the mayor's you know, speak up for the Great Lakes and their connections all the time. They realize the economic value of Mm. it, the environmental and the social value. So to have that um, Great Lakes Water Quality Board um, and the International Joint Commission bringing together, you know, the federal governments, the U.S., um, you know, Washington and Ottawa, as well as all the eight states and the two provinces in Canada and all the groups that work on the issues, you know, into one room twice a year to talk about the issues, I think has just been... Um, you know, has been really important. And it's a really, it's a model that others should emulate if they really want to build, um, you know, towards the future. 
that's terrific to hear that that that's been so valuable. Uh, last thing that I want to ask you about, which really has to be part of every conversation, is climate change. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you touched on it earlier uh, with I think talking about increased precipitation and what that's doing. Uh, but but what are the the impacts of of climate change that that you're seeing there in Toronto, Lake Ontario, that are you know really impacting the water? It's there's just so much uncertainty. Hmm. Um, you know, it's creating, um, we have to build in resilience. Of course we have to, um, plan for, you know, shorter and more intensive rainstorms. Um, you know, year, a few years ago, I don't know if you remember it on the great lakes, there were, you know, there was really high water in the late eighties and then we had really low water and now 2017 and 2019 on Lake Ontario, the highest water in 100 years. And I know we're reaching that on the other Great Lakes um, this year. Um, yeah, the water is so high on Huron and Michigan; it's unbelievable. I've seen all the you know all the photos and videos from the Thousand Islands too. Just in just mm-hmm. levels, I can't believe oh, yeah. dot places I've swam and docks and boathouses mm-hmm. where like the water is is up. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and so that you know, oftentimes those rains they overwhelm our. Our, our, our infrastructure and our sewage systems and our the ways we keep our waste out of the lake but they also you know they're washing away shorelines um they're they're causing havoc and all of it's because of this crazy weather that is breaking you know 100 year records and there's so much uncertainty about it and so much um anxiety <laughs> about where it's going in the future and and our politicians and our environmental groups we're all everyone's starting to recognize that we need to really plan for that uncertainty and we need to build in resilience if we're going to protect our drinking water and protect our ecosystem and protect our, our connections to the lake and so climate change is a real worry and um and i think everybody sees you know the impact it's having on our on our um on our plans and our blueprints uh, yeah. for our cities and how we build them and that those have to change and we have to adapt as we move forward. I can't predict, you know, everyone thinks I've been at this for 30 years that I can tell them <laughs> <laughs> where the water levels are going to be in five years. I really don't know. And I look at everything and I look to government and I think that they're just as, they're just as um, confused. It's really hard to predict which direction it's going in, but we know it's, it's changing. Sure, sure. Well, Mark, I am glad we caught up. I really, uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, you know, like you, like you said, there was. It's not just about the technical policy stuff, but all this meaning uh, behind it. And I could feel that when you talked about Swim Guide and when you talked about Watermark and uh, and the communities there. So I, I appreciate what you're doing. Um, and as, as someone that. Uh, uses that water, I guess, downstream of Lake Ontario in the, in the St. Lawrence <laughs> River there. But uh, yeah, thanks so much and, and look forward to catching up again at some point. Well, thank you, Travis. I wore my um, Ireland Canada Swim Guide t-shirt. We have a, <laughs> a, group, a group in Ireland now who's um, using Swim Guide. So it's what we started here on Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River is certainly expanding and we're really proud of that. And I'm really happy to know that you're a, a loyal Swim Guide user. So thank you very much Absolutely. for having me today. All right. Take care. Take care. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. The Waterloop podcast is brought to you by High Sierra Showerheads, the smart and stylish way to save water, energy, and money while enjoying a powerful shower. Use promo code Waterloop for 20% off at highsierrashowerheads.com. You're in the Waterloop. Waterloop.